Good morning, folks. It's so good to see you. And when I say that, I mean literally good to see you. Uh, we're trying something new today. Um, we are in good company with Dr. Michael Osterholm with us today. And instead of closing us off, we thought we'd have a nice fireside conversation with Michael today. So we are able to see you. And if you have a question, you'll be able to unmute and ask the question yourself. I am Ruby Wynn. I'm a faculty member here in epidemiology and health, and I coordinate our um, seminars, which occurs every Friday at this time, so we hope to see you back. As you know, um, Dr. Michael Osterholm is a Regents Professor. He's also a McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair of Public Health, and you may know him as the Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, or what we call CIDRAP. He's long served as an advisor to the federal government in times of national threat and threats to health and security. During these pandemic times, he has served on President Biden's COVID-19 advisory board. But I first learned of Michael's work when I was an undergraduate here at the University of Minnesota a long time ago. And the state health department was investigating um, the Schwann's plant as the source of a national salmonella outbreak. In fact, I still use that investigation and his public health communication to teach my students in introductory epidemiology. In fact, today I'd like to play one minute, I've gotten his approval to be able to do this, but I'd like to play one minute of his interview on PBS's Almanac from 1995, in which he describes the quote unquote third phase of an outbreak because I thought these were prophetic words for our conversation today as well as, well as our world today. So if you will bear with me, I'm gonna share the screen. It's just about a one minute video clip. Or what is it? Well, and that's where it gets into the third phase. The third phase is actually to figure out what happened. I mean, our job is not just to document an outbreak, but also to make certain it doesn't happen again. And the only way you can do that is to find out how it happened. We're confident we're going to do that. Um, uh, tonight, we're, we have preliminary findings in our own area that would suggest that we're going to learn what it is. And uh, we hope that with a couple of more days of investigation that we'll be able to say well, conclusively. So... Perhaps it can be argued that we are in the third phase of the um, pandemic, and our conversation today will largely focus around um, how do we come out of it and uh, what do we need to do in order to prepare for what is to come. So I'm going to tell you um, how we set up today. We've identified a few major topics, we being the Division of Epidemiology and community health, um, and people have submitted some questions, but we'll be able to take additional questions as well. So the topics will be um, waning immunity, future vaccination administrations, new variants, policy decisions on mandates, what we've learned about public health preparedness, for example, what do we need to improve upon, and how do we as a leading school of public health lead out of this pandemic? So I'll lead off every topic with a question, um, and then we'll open it up for your questions. You can simply uh, raise your hand, um, I'll call on you, and then I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. We'll take as many questions as we can from any given topic, and then we'll need to move on to the next section. Um, as Michael had discussed with me prior to, to our starting, um, hopefully we'll have a week to discuss this, but unfortunately we don't. We only have until 11 o'clock today. So. So Michael, I know you're not going to dinner parties because of, well, the obvious, but if you were to go to dinner parties, how would you answer the question, how's work going for you? Interesting. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, thank you, first of all, Ruby, for having me. And uh, thank you for everyone who's joined. I see a number of uh, familiar and dear faces on the screen here, and I'm I, I almost feel like that uh, Groucho Marx line is, you know, who'd want to join in a club that have me as a member? What are all you doing here? You, you already know this uh, stuff, but it's great to see you. I would say probably the message I would give is one that I don't think that we have had nearly enough in science and public health. And that is, if nothing else, COVID has taught us the absolute need for humility. I think that we have as scientists often found the need to provide information and absolutes 
We want to be able to say to the world, this is X, Y, and Z. And frankly, you know, as some of you have heard me say, every morning, the first thing I do is I get up and uh, try to scrape the five inches of mud off my crystal ball that's sitting alongside my bed. And, you know, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that these days. It's getting crustier. I think the other part of it also is, is that I think back to, it was actually one year ago this week, this very week, that I got into, uh, you might say, a public relations jam around the world because I came out and said that despite the fact that the case numbers were dropping precipitously from that January peak that we'd seen in the United States and that vaccines were flowing, that I thought that the potential for the darkest days of the pandemic were still ahead of us. And that was because what I was looking at was the new variants. And I know we're going to talk about variants today. And they are such a wild card. They are an absolute wild card in this uh, whole pandemic. And when I saw what Alpha and Beta and Gamma were doing, I thought, you know, what's to keep the other variants from emerging, which ultimately Delta and Omicron did. And we're not done. We're not done. I mean, right now, people are trying to find, you know, a way to move on past this pandemic. Later today, you're going to hear an announcement from the CDC about changing their criteria or establishing criteria, I should say, for when people should be doing things like masking and so forth. And so I, I think that if I would say anything, uh, one is we're not done with this pandemic yet. Uh, I, I look at it as we exist somewhere between the right and left guardrail. On the left guardrail is a illness that uh, basically takes on more of influenza-like characteristics with potential seasonality, potential impact in terms of morbidity and mortality, what it does to our healthcare systems. Um, and then on the other side of the road uh, is one that says there could be a new variant that emerges in the days, weeks, months ahead that uh, has, has properties of immune evasion that are gonna make a fair amount of the immunity that we've had already to, in our population that we've accomplished either through vaccination or unfortunately through illness um, is gonna be challenged. And you know we don't know where we sit between those two guardrails. And I think that is really, really important for people to understand. I want to hope that it's going to be that left guardrail where it's gonna be influenza-like illness. But as many of you have heard me say time and time again, hope is not a strategy. And so we're on the right guardrail. We've got to be prepared. What happens again if we see uh, the kind of challenges that a new um, variant could bring us? This is different than influenza. This is not an influenza pandemic. And we have to understand that because if it were an influenza pandemic, we could probably feel pretty confident that at two to three years out, we're going to see more of a seasonal flu-like picture from that virus that caused the pandemic. I don't know what this uh, COVID virus is going to do. Let me just conclude by saying, of all of my career, I've been out at the University of Minnesota 47 years. I see Henry's on here. Henry, you still are my dean in the sense of uh, uh, your lo longevity and wonderful contributions. But you know, uh, in my 47 years in public health, I've never seen data like I saw this past year, where white-tailed deer in the state of Iowa with looking at roadkill deer that were therefore really incident information because it was collected daily across the state, we watched them go become infected with SARS-CoV-2, Delta, and we watched the numbers in the white-tailed deer parallel the actual incidents in humans in the state of Iowa. I mean, that was incredible. How were the deer getting that? Where did it come from? How did it get transmitted across the range so you could see going from 10 or 15% positivity to, you know, 50, 60, 70% positivity. That's remarkable. I have no explanation for that. That's why I say, again, we don't know. And in this case, when you ask me, you know, what I think about where we're at, I have no clue what the animal populations that are now infected with this virus, and there are many. What is that going to do to spill back to us? We didn't see that with influenza. And so we don't know. You know, it's not just humans that may be harboring the next variant that shows up, but it could also be animals. So to sum it up, I, I don't know if we're at the beginning, if we're in the middle or at the end of this pandemic. And that feels very, very humbling to be in that place. So there's been audience feedback and appreciation <laughs> for your use of the term and concept of humbling. Michael, with regards to um, waning immunity, we've had a pretty exciting couple of weeks um, with new findings regarding how long um, immunity lasts post 
third dose um, of vaccination. Um, it's interesting and it's exciting. However, it is contrary to what we were thinking and potentially foreseeing previously with a fourth dose. Um, so what are your thoughts on the new results? Um, and what are your thoughts on a fourth dose? Well, let's back up again and just say humbly. We have no clue at this point, and I shouldn't say we don't have a clue, but we really have no great understanding of what is a correlative protection for this illness. Uh, you know, we, we unfortunately have this kind of historic perspective, the concepts of herd immunity and long-term and short-term duration. Is this more of a illness that is like measles where eventually you can acquire a long-term standing immunity? Or is this an infection more like norovirus, where you may get 12 or 18 months of protection, but then the waning immunity, you're back to susceptible again. And we don't know that yet. We don't understand this yet. Remember when we had the first vaccine trials, particularly with the mRNA vaccines and run here largely in the United States, the whole approach was to get something approved as quickly as possible for emergency use authorization. What that meant was we gave dose one at day one, and then we gave dose two for uh, one vaccine at three weeks and dose uh, uh, two for the other vaccine at four weeks. I think immunologically, uh, anyone who looks at that says, well, that's not a good combination. I mean, you're basically uh, you know, hitting the immune system long, long before you might want to in terms of really getting maximum long-term response. And by the way, what is that response? What happens? And, and I mean, immunologically with T cells, B cells, the whole combination. But at the time we got these results that said, wow, you know, we, we actually had a major reduction in infection, not just serious illness hospitalizations. And I hear people say this all the time. You know, we never went into this looking to prevent infection. It was always about serious illness hospitalizations and deaths. Well, I've got the clips. I've got the information that says, no, we were pretty excited back in uh, the summer of 2020 saying that in fact, Look at how great these vaccines were. Never considered concepts of waning immunity, never considered would we have a better response uh, and for both B cells and T cells, if we delayed, you know, we spaced out the vaccines, what is the doses we needed to use? We got a result that said, we're turning the corner. And, and I think that that misled us for months into thinking that, you know, today, even uh, CDC's definition of fully vaccinated with two doses makes no sense whatsoever. None, because the data are compelling today that yes, you get protection after two doses, but in fact, as you pointed out, Ruby, we see this sense of waning immunity. And I don't talk about it just immunologically. I look at it from a clinical epidemiologic standpoint. We can show clearly at three to five months out from that second dose, that there is a major increase in the in incidence of severe illness, hospitalizations and deaths. And we have data um, that we're going to be releasing soon that shows it goes all the way down to age 20. It's not just for older people. It, if the farther you get out, the, the greater the likelihood. So third dose, and, and I've been saying this for a year, not very successfully, we should never have thought of this as two doses and a booster. This likely should have always been thought of as a three prime vaccine. And so from that perspective, we have the data that shows that three doses can really improve on the protection that we see with that waning protection uh, that we see with two doses. Now, the challenge is we're now seeing waning immunity with a third dose. And you asked the question about four doses. Uh, this is where I think we really have to ask ourselves, you know, what is our long-term goal here, particularly with this particular virus? We saw Omicron was a much more likely uh, candidate virus to evade immune protection than we saw with Delta. Uh, and will other additional uh, variants even be more like that? And so we're not quite sure what that means. Well, how much of the waning immunity was actually just due to Omicron versus the fact that it is a ongoing challenge we're gonna have every four to five months you have to revaccinate, which is not gonna happen globally, we got. Think about this. I mean, here we have already made the case for three doses being so important. And yet only 42% of those people who have had two doses have gotten a third dose. These are not vaccine hesitant. These are not vaccine hostile people. They've already gotten two doses. Yet we can't get a third dose in them when we know how important that is. Well, imagine now telling them they need a fourth or fifth dose. And so I think that that, that is gonna raise challenges. 
Now, in terms of looking at immunity, I think we have focused far, far too much on, on basically B cell based immunity, antibody, surely important. I think T cell immunity is going to be really critical down the road in terms of long term protection. And what does that mean? Well, if you look, probably the most, I think, amazing data that I've seen in the last five weeks actually is data that nobody's talking about. And that is the fact we've had five different studies now that have come out showing that if you first get infected and then get one dose of vaccine, that is probably the best immunity we have right now in terms of longevity and actually preventing breakthroughs. And why? Well, what data we have shows that with natural infection, as they call it, and I hate that term, but this the colloquial term out there that's being used, if you look at any definition of epidemiology or immunology, nobody has a natural infection definition. But if you look at people who have been infected, they are stimulating a variety of immune response aspects, both in B cells and T cells. And Whereas if you get vaccinated, it's a much more limited repertoire of response that gets duplicated every time then you get revaccinated or vaccinated again. And it, it should tell us something. We should be looking at this carefully to say, what does this mean? Also, it gets back to the debate. How many times have you seen the politics of this pandemic get caught up in infection versus the issue of vaccinated for quote unquote, being fully vaccinated? And we have to understand that previous infection does play a role in immunity. It by itself is not perfect. We have studies showing clearly that, that you know, having been infected only still puts you at risk. But if you've been vaccinated with that extra dose, it looks to be effective. So again, I come back to the fact that I think we're going to see major uh, uh, new pieces of information coming out on immunity and the fact that uh, we have to look very carefully at a combination of what infection means and vaccination and what can we learn from that. I do not advocate for a moment anyone go get infected so they can get that first dose from infection because that could be also the infection that kills you. And so, you know, we, we, we don't have the luxury of encouraging people to get infected and then getting that extra dose. The last thing I would say though about this is uh, do not for a moment think that these are the last vaccines. Uh, SIDRAP, which has led the international effort for an influenza vaccine roadmap, uh, so a process that took us almost three years with WHO, the Wellcome Trust, Gates Foundation, et cetera. And we now have published on our site the very, very detailed influenza vaccine roadmap that is how to get from where we're at to highly protective, more universal like vaccines. And, and so that in that regard, we're doing now the same thing for coronaviruses. Uh, Gates and uh, Rockefeller, WHO, we're working together to come up with a coronavirus uh, a roadmap. And I think you're gonna see uh, in the not too distant future, uh, vaccine 2.0, 3.0, and even 4.0, which I hope will actually capture more of both durability and the robust nature of what these vaccines have to do. And again, I just come back to the immune, immune evasion issue. That is gonna be a huge, huge question for us. What does that mean going forward? How good is immunity regardless of how you got it over time? The last point, let me just say, I do wanna really emphasize the importance of fourth doses for the 7.5 million people who are immune compromised. Uh, the data are very compelling that you get a much better response after the fourth one than you do the third one. And while you're still at risk of having a serious infection uh, in terms of uh, severe illness, uh, hospitalizations and deaths as an immune compromised individual, uh, the fourth dose is surely uh, helpful in reducing that risk. But for right now for the public, I think we're all trying to understand what role will or the for fourth dose play or not play. Thanks, Mike. Emeritus Dean Finnegan, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, Ruby <laughs> and Michael. Good to see thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Good to see you. My question has to do with the, the issue of the organization uh, that's needed to look at things like uh, the science with, with respect to waning uh, immunity and so forth. And I noticed in the article that you and Zeke Emanuel and uh, Celine Grounder wrote, 
you know, you, you use the concept of humility. You also talk <laughs> about the need for a national plan. And, of course, we're all talking about the need for some kind of a, of a global plan on this. So when you look at the science of this area right now, I mean, do we have a lot of uh, sort of individual entrepreneurs trying to figure this out? Or is there enough coordination to really make the science as effective as it needs to be? A uh, great question, and uh, in a very wise professorial answer, I'll say yes, no, and maybe, okay? And we're somewhere in there, okay? Um, if you've been following the media the last 24 hours, you may be aware of the fact that there is a major blueprint plan that's being put together by a group of people for the administration. It's in the New York Times this morning. Uh, it was a headline story in ABC yesterday, etc. cetera. Uh, I happen to be involved with that. And uh, there will be, in short order, a, a very comprehensive plan coming out about all these different issues of what we must do just in the next year. And it covers a variety of different topics. Um, and I'm confident that this will help provide more coordination and collaboration. I think the problem that we continue to have is the fact that everybody wants this thing over. You know, if you look in the last three weeks, uh, and, and I know, Ruby, you want to get to this later, so I won't try to upstage it now. But if you look at everyone removing the mask mandate, for which something I have real problems with, the mask mandate. But the bottom line was there was no scientific data to do that. It was all the governors reading the tea leaves of the people out there who said, I'm tired and done with this pandemic. And yet, if you look at the numbers of cases, the number of hospitalizations, the number of ICU beds used, and the number of deaths, we were at numbers that would have exceeded all the previous peaks. But it's like that classic Minnesota experience where if you have an entire week of minus 30 degree days, suddenly when you get 20 to 25 degrees, you go outside with your coat unzipped. It's so darn warm. But on the other hand, if that 25 degree day occurs in the end of June, we're freezing. It's all about baselines. It's where you're at. What, what is it relative to? So here we've just as a country chosen to basically get over this pandemic at numbers that a year ago were house on fire. And I think that what this, what, why I'm raising this is because I worry that the world is so ready to get over COVID and this virus when it's not ready to get over us is the fact that we could have another big surge as I just talked about where we have this immune evasion, et cetera. And so when you have a world that doesn't want to deal with COVID, they don't want to, you know, we don't need any more research. You know, we don't need more issues uh, to address. And that's been a challenge. Even the question is, why do we really need new vaccines or not? Look at the vaccines we have, okay? Well, there, there we got some challenges. They're remarkable tools, but they're not perfect. And so I, I think that the biggest hurdle we have right now is keeping interest in why we have to be prepared. And that's why I, I say, I feel like right now it's almost deja vu all over again for me, because I'm sitting here trying to beat the drum of saying it's the variants. You know, some of you heard me say this, you know, for the couple of you on the screen that are old enough to remember the old fifth dimension. You know, every morning I wake up to this hum in my head that this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, except for me, it's the dawning of the age of the variants, you know, and I don't know what those variants are going to bring. And so I think that we, John, have to continue to put this out. And I hope this plan that you're going to see in the near term uh, will, in fact, lay out that kind of thing. And it covers, for example, I'll just, I, I can't get into it in any detail, but it covers the issues of surveillance and data and vaccines and, and you know, the whole issue of, of public relations, the issue of understanding the sociology of all of this. It's really important. Um, you know, I, I, people ask me all the time, you know, what, what was the big surprise you had with this one? And frankly, you know, the virus itself hasn't surprised me all that much. What surprised me, if anything, is how people have reacted. And I acknowledge the fact that if you look at Ebola, you look at 2009 H1N1, they were all short lived compared to this, you know, four months, five months, eight months. But now we're into our third year. And people, the fatigue factor is setting in besides the politicization in such a way that our job is going to make sure people don't want to just move on and, and, and not address this, because I promise you this virus is not done with us yet. It's not. Thank you. Dr. Frizzell. How, 
Good Hi, morning. I want I want to thank you <laughs> for, for uh, requiring me to be in a house where I think it's almost up to minus 20. <laughs> so I don't have to go outside. But anyhow, my question is, and of course, you know, you've been to my classes and, and, and me and my students are both wondering, has anybody been testing for what the level of immunization is from the breakthrough cases? Yeah, uh, to some degree there, there has been, but again, let me come back and just emphasize that the challenge we have is we don't have good correlates of protection. Uh, you know, probably the best data I've seen so far, uh, and it's not yet public, but it will be in sometime soon, is related to T cell immunity. Well, we've never used T cell correlates of protection because they're so difficult to measure. And we don't know quite what they mean, but if you look at some of the studies so far, there may be some hints of certain T cell issues. So one of the problems we've had is we've not had good markers to measure. Just total antibody in of itself, you know, neutralizing antibody hasn't necessarily correlated well. And remember also it's over time. Again, I just come back to any of the students here, you know, you, you get a measles infection or you even get vaccinated with your primary series, series with measles, you got some pretty incredible protection for a long, long, long time. And, and so the challenge we have right now is that with this virus, it doesn't look like that happens. And so one of the challenges we have is, is that you have to measure it over time. So just because I have a point now and said so this is what the level of protection is in that population, come back and tell me what it's like in six months. And of course, you know, we're, we're as long as three years now going into this seems so very, very long. It's actually a very short time because remember vaccines weren't available for the first year largely. And so we've not had but a year's worth of experience with these vaccines to understand what does long term immunity mean? You know, so I think that that at this point, uh, we, we need to look at all of these issues and clearly the epidemiologic data just looking at the incidence of severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths over time after a point where you were vaccinated or you've had previous infection is important. That's helping us get there. But as I pointed out earlier, I think some of the most uh, helpful data I've seen so far has been that issue of previous infection and then a dose of vaccine in terms of durability of long-term protection. Uh, two of these studies had uh, a follow-up for more than 10 months and we're still seeing what appeared to be good protection. So I wish I knew more. Again, humility. We don't. We, we, we. The more we learn, the less I know. Yeah, just trying to stay ahead of this mess <laughs> and survive it, basically. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, we're looking forward to the SIDRAP roadmap, um, and we're wondering <laughs> if it's going to include um, public health practice, so administration of vaccination. And we have a question from the audience that asks. So stepping back from um, the immunology, um, that asks when will do you think vaccines will be available in general medicine clinics versus um, the very specified pop-up clinics that we currently have? Well, uh, this, this is a question that uh, is a real challenge. Yesterday was the lowest number of new people vaccinated in the United States since uh, January of 2021. If you look at the curve of people vaccinated per day, it's just come down dramatically. Remember, only 64% of our population has received even a dose of vaccine that could be vaccinated. What's going on? Why? And if you look at on a global basis right now, I, I surely want to be very cautious about this because I don't think the explanation is quite as simple as has been laid. But as you saw this past week, COVAX, you know, the WHO supported activity to get vaccine to low and middle income countries halted all new donations because they're sitting in a surplus of vaccine where the low and middle income countries are saying, don't send us anymore. We can't use what we have. And yet there is a limited number of people vaccinated. Now, some have alleged that that's because of vaccine hostility, vaccine hesitancy. We also know that it surely has to do with supply chains, cold chain uh, delivery, and so forth to get that done too. So it's not just the fact that people won't or won't, don't get it. But there clearly is an element out there globally of vaccine hesitancy and, and I, a term I came up with vaccine hostility, which is people actually actively trying to keep people from getting vaccinated. So I think that we have a lot to do to understand this. And what I'm my big concern is, is that 
this is not going to stay with COVID. We're already beginning to see evidence of this in childhood immunizations. We're beginning to see it, I think, across the board. I mean, right now, we just did a story in the SIDRAP News a week and a half ago about the fact that we in Minnesota had ample supplies of the one monoclonal antibody that worked against Omicron, as well as both of the approved drugs under emergency use authorization. And we had ample supplies that nobody used while we had a lot of people dying in Minnesota. What happened? Why couldn't we get those? And some of it was clearly access to care. This is where I think health disparities, racial disparities are critically important. Uh, some of it was they couldn't get testing in time, which was a limiting factor. Some of it was, you know, that issue. But we also witnessed clearly people saying, I'm not going to take that. I want my ivermectin, but I'm not going to take that. And, and, you know, what's the disconnect there? You know, I'll take an unapproved product that to date, no good randomized controlled trial has demonstrated that it's effective, and yet people will take that. So I think it's not just about how you administer the vaccine. It's not just about outreach. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do to understand the psyche of the world today, not just the United States, about public health practices like this and what they mean. And I think that uh, it's going to be bigger than COVID. This is where schools of public health, I think, are going to be such an important resource in moving forward. How do we understand this? And what does it mean? What do we do about it? How do we communicate? You know, where do these knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs get formed? How do they get formed? You know, um, you know so I, I think that from that perspective, this is really you know, and John just posted in here about social and behavior science and public health. I couldn't agree more. I hope there's a renaissance of behavioral and social aspects of public health science in the future. It's going to take that to understand this. And, you know, I, I just have to say, you know, I um, it, it's very painful for me to watch what's happening right now in the Ukraine. I've been to the Ukraine several times. I have dear friends there. I love that country. And if you'd asked me, Five years ago, would we see a war equivalent to what happened back in the 1930s and 40s? I'd have said, no, no. It's a new world order. It's a new world order. And it's a new world order for public health. And we have to understand that. It's a very different world. And so I think, to, I know I've had a long answer here, but I want to impress upon people how important I think this issue is. This is a huge, huge issue. So from our roadmap perspective, we are going to obviously emphasize how important that is, but I, we're not gonna pull any elephants out of a hat. Okay, we're not. You know, it's going to take a lot more work and research and understanding of why and how we got to this place so that we can try to change it. And not just for COVID, but I think for public health in general. Thank you, Michael. Let's move on to new variants. What concerns you about new variants? I know that you're always thinking about them. Well, you know, I, 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 I say this with slight exaggeration, but I think every night I go to bed, I know I got to scrape off that crystal ball in the morning. I know I got that humming in my head. And I think I sleep with one eye open because of the variants. You know, I, I don't think people really understand. I mean, I mean, let me just take a step back and just look at Omicron. We're now trying to understand the difference between two sublineages. There are now three sublineages of Omicron, BA1, BA2, and BA3. And BA1 was what initially emerged and surely did a hell of a job. But now BA2 in a number of countries is beating out BA1. And there was a paper last week uh, from, from Asia on, on hamster cell uh, models suggesting that BA2 was causing more severe disease than BA1. I don't think we have any clinical evidence of that yet, but something's happening where we have that particular subvariant is actually overtaking another one. Well, there has to be some fit, fitness advantage for that to happen, transmissibility, whatever, okay? We don't understand it. Think about this. Here is the same variant, Omicron, BA1 and BA2. There are more mutational differences between BA1 and BA2 than there was between the ancestral virus out of Wuhan and, and Alpha. And here's within the same lineage. This we don't understand. And so to me, as I pointed out earlier, the fact that we can infect so many animal models right now, I mean, uh, you name it, I mean, we've got them infected. 
And we don't understand what this virus will do from an evolutionary standpoint in animals, let alone in humans. You know, we have a world today where fortunately we have people who are immune compromised who are still alive. They didn't die. They're not dying like they did 40 years ago. And that's a great credit. But they also may pose as a very important incubator for these viruses where we have evidence that they may stay infected long term, meaning weeks to months and not succumb to the viral infection, but also be a very rich breeding ground for mutational changes that could then come back at us. And so I think that's the challenge we have right now. We just don't know. And, you know, I know everybody wants to know about these variants going to do. I can just tell you for certain variants are going to continue to be a challenge for us, whether it's immune evasion, whether it's causing more serious illness, um, together with the host that may have some waning immunity. And I, I'd like to say this is all done, but it's not. And there's no other infectious agent I've dealt with in my career that's like this. You know, I've spent a lot of time in influenza pandemics. You know, I've spent a lot of time in HIV AIDS. I've done a lot of areas like this. And this one just has so many unique characteristics. I don't know what the variants are gonna bring, but I will promise you one thing, they will bring something. Thank you. So I invite actually all of you to come back next week. We'll, we'll be having an alum from the epidemiology program who's currently working at NIH on um, a platform for vaccine development for the next wave of fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Wing, please ask your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Mike. Great to hi see there. you again Good here. to see you. Um, so um, since I'm not part of the U or IMV, um, um, brief introduction, I, um, I supervise or I lead the sequencing and bioinformatic activity here at the uh, Public Health Lab, Minnesota Department of Health. Yep. Um, and um, since my, my lab is uh, one of the first public health lab in the nation who starts SARS-CoV-2 whole genome sequencing and share with the public. And also we find the nation's first gamma variant and first nation's domestic transmission Omicron variant. I guess my question is, um, Mike, what do you see as a comprehensive variant surveillance system? And I can only speak, you know, in yeah. the jurisdiction of Minnesota. Yeah, no, uh, first of all, congratulations on the work you do. You really have been a, a national leader and I, I, I wanna make sure everybody knows that. So thank you. Uh, you know, I think that the relationship between uh, the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota has been a, a, a blessing for all these years. And uh, Henry, I give you some credit. You you were one of the ones that got us involved back in epidemiology way back when, uh, working together with the health department and uh, the U. So I think this is important. Well, first of all, as a scientist, as an epidemiologist, as a public health practitioner, my ultimate four letter word in everything I do professionally is data, 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 okay? I love data, <laughs> I want data. Uh, and clearly there are many different reasons why. One of them is just understanding the basic science, okay? What's going on? And so as we're trying to describe this issue with the variants you yourself can identify with the challenges of what are these variants doing? What does it mean? But the second thing is also detecting them quickly. Now you can say, even if you do detect them quickly, what difference does it make? Well, from a public health uh, uh, intervention standpoint, it hasn't meant that much difference. I mean, in the end, how we respond with our general uh, uh, recommendations doesn't matter which variant it is. But where we've seen a big difference, and I think a critical issue and why the work you're doing and from a clinical perspective is so important, is we just hit into a brick wall in December in throughout the world when two of the three monoclonal antibodies we had that we were treating with ended up not working because of the fact that the Omicron mutations basically neutralized what that, what that monoclonal could do. Only one worked. Now, what happened was the U.S. pulled the trigger on very incomplete information and took two of them, those two off the available list and gave us just the third one. Well, there were a whole lot of areas in the country, including Minnesota, where Delta was still really active and those two monoclonals would have worked. And we necessarily, unfortunately, limited who could get monoclonals because we took those two off the market. If we had had timely sequencing and variant identification of what someone's infection was, not just are you positive or not, but what is the virus that you have, we could have better utilized 
these monoclonals, much like we do antibiotics. You know, is this virus, is this particular bacteria sensitive to or resistant to this drug? That allows us to make an informed decision about what to use. So I think that one of the challenges we have is how do we, from a testing standpoint, and I do believe this will happen as we look at new and more rapid test detection methods and the need for a very comprehensive uh, understanding of what do we have to have from a public health testing and surveillance standpoint that can be integrated into clinical care quickly. And so uh, I do see this as very important. And, uh, and I think for that benefit, uh, you know, as long as monoclonals are there. And the other thing we're always concerned about, and at least one of the drugs we are working with, this is a challenge, is will resistance develop? Will we actually see a resistance situation? So we also want to know that. We don't want to be treating people with uh, with this. You know, I, I, I just have to say, and, you know, Alan Lifson I saw was on here. I don't see on my front screen right now, but, you know, Alan and I cut our teeth on HIV AIDS in those earliest days together. And, you know, in the 1980s, HIV was a death sentence. It was simply a death sentence. Today, it's a manageable chronic disease for many people. Not nearly enough. We still need more of the treatment issues, but it's because of the drug and what they did. And I think with this disease, vaccines are going to be key. There will be the foundational public health response. May not be perfect, but they're going to be remarkable. But the drug availability, if done quickly with these effective drugs, could also be game changers from keeping people not to be infected, but to keep them from becoming hospitalized patients, seriously ill and dying. And so, again, that's going to take a system of testing of rapid identification of who people are who are infected. You can't spend four days to get your PCR back. In some cases, it may make a difference what variant you are infected with if we're seeing a transition time between different variants. And this is what we have to envision for the future, a system like this, much like we at the time in the early 1980s could never have envisioned for HIV, look where we're at today. And I think that's really an important uh, analogy because it gives us hope that we can do a lot more uh, with with good data and clinical availability. I would welcome your thoughts if you have any other thoughts on that. You're you're in the front lines. <laughs> well, um, yes, I think, I mean, or I'm looking at our current tool shed. I mean, there's, you know, sequencing on clinical specimens and you are absolutely right in terms of we need to integrate the variant information with the clinical part, but that requires uh, a, cl uh, a clear validation of the assay, which can be really tricky because the, the definite way yeah, to, yeah. Uh, you know, for a variant is sequencing. Um, and then we also have wastewater surveillance and that could play a, a vital role as well. And, um, and we're also actually right now, the two white deer uh, specimens are in our lab for sequencing. So we should have some sort of result next week. So yeah. personally, I do think uh, uh, you know, VDL's participation in terms of the animal reservoir and um, the uh, community testing sites, um, as well as with emphasis on the airport is actually quite critical personally, I mean, from a personal perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm looking at all the alpha, beta, gamma, Omicron variant, it started with importation. Uh, I'm just talking about Minnesota. Um, and, you know, spread within the Metronic and uh, metropolitan area, and then like, you know, spread to the rural Minnesota. So with emphasis on airports or travelers, domestic, international, decent size percentage of the community surveillance animal testing uh, in collaboration with BDL, um, loop in wastewater surveillance. I'm not sure about the air filtering yep. surveillance. Uh, this is a part that I don't know. But I mean, those are the components that in my mind, in terms of comprehensive surveillance yep. variant. Uh, yep. But yeah, right. that's just some random thoughts. Sorry. Thank you Thanks. so much. And thank you for the collaboration um, with the Minnesota Department of Health. Let's move on to our next topic. You've brought it up um, and it's policy decisions on mandates. There were a lot of questions um, <laughs> previous to the seminar on this, essentially all revol revolving around, you know, when, when can a decision be made? But I, I think I'm gonna tweak the questions to be more about what do we offer policymakers as epidemiologists and public health practitioners for 
the decisions to be made. So the premature decisions, and I think in your in your words, um, that were made in other states, what what were they lacking, Mike? In, yeah, yeah. In the well, first of all, for all the students, this is for you. For the rest of you, just tune out. This is a lesson in dealing with media. Okay, never answer the question that's asked. Answer the question you want to answer. Okay, so Ruby, I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> uh, in that regard. Um, First of all, we have to understand that, again, the world of public health has changed. I can just tell you from the days in the 70s and early 80s when I would be at the state legislature and testify, if you were in public health, it was almost a, a kind of sacred position, almost as if it was kind of a, you know, a religious experience and you were afforded a lot of respect. Today, public health globally often is not well respected. It's not seen as a prime driver or a, a, you know, a major player in what goes on. And I look no further than to the criticism you see right now of the CDC and how that's been a real challenge and what that means. And so I bring that up because the power of public health has largely been through persuasion or certain actions. We all think about Jon Snow pulling the pump handle that famous story, which actually is only partially true. But the bottom line is, is that we will occasionally take action. And, and that clip you showed of me on the Schwann's ice cream outbreak, you know, that was one where uh, was an example where we took an action where we went public and said that this product was the source of transmission and Swans did not agree. And they were working actively. Their most active effort was to work with Governor Carlson to get me fired. And obviously it backfired on them. Uh, we did show that they were the source, et cetera. But there was an example where we used the power of public health persuasion because there wasn't enough data for the FDA to pull the product, even though we knew it was real. It was there. And we did it on epidemiologic data, not just like the pump handle. And so public health has to have a certain cachet or a certain power respect in the community to do some of these things. And when you start talking about mandates, that even takes on more of that because the mandates are guaranteed to cause you challenges by some who believe any hairy arm of government that can tell you what you have to do, even though, of course, we do that all the time with speed limits and things like that, um, will disagree to the point of actually challenging it and then creating friction. So I think from a mandate standpoint, you have to understand what are you trying to accomplish and at what cost versus what benefit. I wrote an op-ed in April of 2020 in the Washington Post opposing lockdowns. And I opposed them as lockdowns as were being defined. I mean, I gotta tell you here in Minnesota, and, and Minnesota it was not at fault any more than the other state, but we had many areas of rural Minnesota, we had no cases and we had mom and pop hardware stores shut down. Yet if you went to Duluth or you went to Worthington, you could go to the Home Depot. They were open because they were allowed to stay open and it made no sense to the public. And we lost them. We lost them. When a lockdown is that term, which is like nails on a chalkboard, when you want to limit people's uh, possible exposure to the virus is when you're seeing the surge. That I support and said, you know, basically if you don't prepare for a hurricane, in the middle of a winter, you prepare for a hurricane usually in the month before a hurricane season starts. Okay. You know, so to me, one of the challenges we have, we never really looked at what does this tool mean? What are we trying to do? What's the downside? What's the upside of this kind of tool? At the same time, I will say, again, thinking of Ebola, thinking of, of, of issues around H1N1 in 2009, we didn't also understand what fatigue would do. We have a lot of people today that have basically are done with the virus who for 18 months were very, very compliant and supportive of what we could do to limit transmission. You know, we're kind of the positive voices in the community saying, I'm done, I, I, I gotta move on, okay? And so I think we also didn't understand fatigue and what that means, okay? The final piece though, is we didn't really understand what we were doing in terms of trying to have an impact. I categorically reject the concept that just by saying we're following the science means that you are right. 
And we, you hide behind that so much. I've seen so many of my colleagues follow the science. If you look at masking, mask mandates, I think, have been a disaster in this country. Why? Because the vast majority of mask mandates have made no difference whatsoever. Because as an aerosol transmitted virus, and the data are compelling now. You know, I wrote a paper in April of 2020 saying this issue, and it just now people are really starting to understand. CDC has finally come around, WHO, that aerosols are very different than respiratory droplets. You know, we've just spent billions of dollars in hygiene theater around plexiglass and things like that that had no different, made no difference in the transmission of this virus. This is like smoke. This is like perfume. If I'm in a room 20 by 20 feet and somebody's smoking, can I smell it? You damn bet I can. Okay, that's an aerosol. And if you're not using an N95 or potentially a KN95 face fitted, if you're a man with a beard on, there's no way you can get adequate protection for you or the fact that you're releasing virus out there because you don't have a seal on it, no fit. And had we put those kinds of protection forward and said that we're going to mandate those, then we would have been doing something. But we allowed everything from a face cloth covering to surgical masks. Surgical masks do not provide protection like this. And the studies that were done supporting this, if one of my graduate students designed this study, I'd have flunked them. They're terrible. When you go back and look at the data we have, it's clear and compelling that in fact, you have to have a quality of protection at the level of an N95 respirator. So I looked, you know, and I, I watch people all the time. I, I, we've been doing a study where we freeze frames of television news programs and look at crowd scenes and look at who's wearing and not wearing respiratory protection of some kind. The mass majority of it is surgical masks or cloth face coverings, which in each case make no difference. Okay, they, they just limit very little impact at all. And what's even more telling, though, is a quarter of the people a quarter of the people continue to wear it under their nose. Well, that's like fixing three of the five screen doors in your submarine. You know, it, it doesn't do any good. And yet we mandate that, which then has created the friction, has created the angst. And if we had mandated now, on the other hand, mandates for vaccines, I think, have been very important because we do get benefit there. We can show it. So I think, Ruby, the bottom line message is for me, I have such respect for what mandates can and can't do. I understand the impact that they can have in a positive way and a negative way, and just merely throwing it out there. And I've seen so many of my public health colleagues who, and I say this with respect, but they don't have a clue what the hell they're talking about. They just keep saying, oh, we got to have mass mandates to protect people. You know, there are no good data, no good data to support wearing a mask as younger children in schools and daycare make any difference whatsoever because of what they can wear. And yet look how many school based issues we've taken on for real no benefit it was more a matter of because everybody said, well, you got to do it, you should do it. And today's CDC's announcement on the fact that now you can release the mask mandates at certain levels of hospitalization, etc. You know, I've shared with CDC, you know, they still make no sense to me unless you're actually mandating the quality of respiratory protection that will in fact accomplish what you're trying to do. And just to merely say, I can go wear a face cloth covering. And it's so bad. I mean, we actually have, I've had friends and staff that have gone to hospitals with N95s on and been instructed they have to take them off and put a surgical mask on because that's the standard the hospital uses. But I mean, Michael, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt. But no, you go ahead. Um, um, if I was a lawmaker, I would feel that your, some of your responses have put me in a corner. Um, so and on the one hand, some states have made premature decisions to end their mask mandates. And on the other hand, we don't have good yeah, yeah. mask mandate um, data. So we have to make the decision, even here at the University of Minnesota, we have to make the decision at some point about when to, to end this mask mandate. You know, Ruby, I just refuse to participate in arguing about how many angels can dance in the head of a pin. You know, just it's not relevant. So to me, I sit there and say, go ahead with your mask mandate. However, just know you're not having any impact, any meaningful way, if you're not in fact using high quality. And you know, this is just an observational issue. I surely would not use this as data to say it. Right now, Hong Kong is a house on fire. It is a house on fire with COVID. The worst they've seen. They've had more deaths in the last two weeks than they've had in the last two years. 
in the pandemic. Go look at any screenshot. Almost 100% of citizens there continue to wear a surgical mask with no evidence that there's made any difference whatsoever in terms of transmission. And so to me, my job is just tell the truth. I, even if it's an inconvenient truth, just tell it. So I think we got to this place, public health got us here, and they were then supported by various political entities who didn't understand respiratory protection. And I think that at this point, that doesn't mean you then don't try to correct the record and say, okay, we gotta learn from this, we gotta move on. If you really wanna make a difference, find ways to get good respiratory protection that is comfortable enough to wear, that can be reused, and that people will use. And I think that's really, really important in getting that message out. And don't keep doing it because that's what we've always done. So if it puts politicians and public health people in uncomfortable positions, so be it. We've got to tell the truth. Can you integrate or can we integrate testing into any of these um, decisions? Oh, yeah, I think testing is very important. I do have a concern about testing in that I still remain concerned about lateral flow tests in terms of how well they work. The data are very mixed. Uh, you know, we have ample, ample, ample data to show that people four and five days into their infection are still lateral flow test negative when they're PCR positive. Well, you know, if I'm sitting here trying to make a decision, am I going to go see grandpa and grandma tonight for dinner? Is it safe? You know, I've been out and about. Am I incubating? If I take a test and all of a sudden, see, look, at I got a green. Okay, I can go. You know, I know of many situations like that where, in fact, that has resulted in transmission because neither party had any idea. I actually had five different colleagues, by the way, also, even with the testing of right now, over the, uh, the uh, Christmas break have situations where they had college age students coming home. All of them were tested on their respective college campuses anywhere from one to three days before they came home. All of them got their result back, it was negative. All of them as students became ill within the first 24 to 36 hours at home and all five of them transmitted to the family members. There was an example where testing was accurate but it wasn't timely. Yeah. You know, so when we test, for example, schools where we, I saw these programs, we test on the first day of school coming back for the semester, and that was it. That's like buying a house with a smoke alarm that only works the first day you live there, and then it's done. Yeah. You know, we didn't incorporate that in. I saw major programs being undertaken that way. So I think that's what we have to do is go back, and testing is important, but it's got to be applied appropriately and the limitations and strengths understood. Michael, you know better than, than me that we have so many strengths here in the state of Minnesota and in our School of Public Health. We're really at a point in which we can lead coming out of the pandemic, whenever that is. What have we learned from this pandemic um, that can propel us forward in public health? Given well, this, how well if, I, if I could offer a friendly amendment to that question, I don't think we have to wait to come out of the pandemic to lead. You know, I think we can do it right now, and we are. I mean, I hope our center is part of that leadership. I think uh, studies that we're all doing, I, I come back to the social political issues of public health and COVID, and, you know, we are uniquely qualified as a school. I think Rachel Hardiman's work and what's going on in the center there on racial you know, you know, inequalities, health disparities is so huge and, you know, um, is really important. I, I find, you know, working with her to be, a major learning experience for me. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do right now that we have to uh, consider as not just for COVID, but what are the one-off, two-off issues of COVID? I mean, again, I, I can't say it strongly enough. I think the childhood immunization programs of this country are in trouble. Uh, for those who are in chronic diseases, I, I think we're going to be paying a legacy cost for undetected cancers early in the clinical course that are going to result in huge challenges down the road with cancer, morbidity, and mortality. Uh, I, I mean, maternal and child health, you can just go down the list. And so I think these are the times now to begin to look at these. And, you know, if it, things don't get addressed, they won't get uh, uh, taking uh, any kind of financial support, et cetera. And so I think we offer a lot at the School of Public Health uh, in this regard. 
Michael, thank you so much for your time. Michael absolutely has to leave now. <laughs> so he's going to hang up. <laughs> I want well, thank to you. It was, it was good to see so many of you. Thank you for spending the time with me. And uh, I appreciate it very, very much. And again, we'll always welcome your input. Uh, this is a time to be humble and to learn. Trust me, it is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. See Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Mike.